In this lesson, we're going to talk about USB cables, which is the first type of cable you need to understand as a technician. This is because USB or universal serial bus is used by so many different devices these days. But to first understand USB and all of its benefits, we need to take a moment and talk about serial cables, which is what came out before USB and what USB was designed to replace. Now, originally, serial cables were connected to a computer using either a DB9 or DB25 connector, but most commonly, you would see these using a DB9. Now, a DB9 is simply a D-shaped, subminiature type of pin that would then go into the back of a computer. And this particular cable connector would actually have two thumb screws on the side that you would screw that serial cable into the serial port on the back of a computer's motherboard. Now, these were actually very slow connections, and the reason they're called serial is because all the data was sent as ones and zeros in a straight line, so you can only send one bit at a time, and we would measure the speed of these cables in bits per second or, at their highest speeds, in kilobits per second. Now, when we're talking about serial cables, the fastest you're going to find these is up to about 115,000 bits per second, which is often written and spoken as 115 kilobits per second. Again, this is not a very fast connection, but this is where things came from over time and evolved into our new USB or universal serial bus cables. Now, these older cables are still sometimes found today in some very specific use cases, such as when you're connecting to a communications port on a router or switch. But for most of us, we're not going to be using serial cables. Now, when you see a serial cable, normally it is going to be a DB9 type of connector, as shown here. These are going to be used for a slow speed connection and generally for much older mice, keyboards, and external modems. So like I said, most of us are not going to be using these on a daily basis. Now, the important thing to understand from these serial connections, though, is that you could only have one device plugged into one serial port. So you are very limited in what you could connect to your computer. Now, this is one of the big changes that occurred when we move into USB or the universal serial bus. Instead of being able to connect just one device to a single USB port, like we could with a regular serial port, we now can connect up to 127 connected devices in what's known as a daisy chain. For example, on my laptop, I only have three USB ports, and right now I have a microphone, a webcam, and a couple of other devices plugged into it. So if I wanted to have more than three devices connected to this particular laptop, I would have to use a USB hub. And that would allow me to take one port and turn it into either four, eight, or 16 ports. Then I could connect another hub into one of those ports, and that would allow me to daisy chain from one to four, and then from that four to another four, and from that four to another four. And I could keep doing this up to 127 devices per controller on that particular laptop. Now, there is a limitation when you do this, though, and it's not necessarily that limit of 127 devices, but each particular port is controlled by what's known as a host controller. And each host controller uses the same amount of bandwidth for all devices on that particular port. So if I have one device connected to a USB port and it's a USB 3 type of port that supports five gigabits per second, I can give all five gigabits per second to that one device. But if I daisy chained five different devices on that same port, I now can only give up to one gigabit per second to each of those devices because they're sharing that total of five gigabits per second across all the devices in that particular chain. Now, for most users, this isn't going to be a real limitation you're going to experience on a daily basis because our modern USB is very fast. But if you're supporting older computers that use USB 1 or USB 2, these are using a much slower speed USB bus, and therefore, when you split that across a hub, it's going to actually reduce that significantly for your end users. Now, for the exam, it is important to understand the different versions of USB and their different limitations, such as how fast they can transfer data. When you're dealing with low-speed USB, this is known as USB 1.0 and has a maximum speed of 1.5 megabits per second. Now, by today's standards, this is extremely slow. But remember, this was a replacement for serial devices, and serial devices up to that point only dealt with speeds up to 115 kilobits per second, which is 0.115 megabits per second. So this 1.5 megabits per second with USB 1 was actually quite fast. Next, we had USB 1.1 introduced, which was known as full-speed USB. This allowed devices to go up to 12 megabits per second. Then, we introduced USB 2.0, which was known as high-speed USB and high-speed USB can go up to 480 megabits per second. Then we moved into USB 3, 
and this started the era of what's known as super speed USB. Now with super speed USB, we have multiple different generations. In generation one, which was USB 3.1 Gen 1, this could go up to five gigabits per second. And anytime you see a port that's labeled as a super speed USB, you know it goes at least five gigabits per second. Now, the next one we had was USB 3.1 Gen 2, which is known as Super Speed USB 10 gigabits per second. And this is called this because it goes up to 10 gigabits per second. And then there was another generation called Gen 2 X2, which gives us to speeds of 20 gigabits per second, which is normally referred to as Super Speed USB 20 gigabits per second. Now, the most modern version of USB today is actually USB 4, and this can go up to 40 gigabits per second. Now, this is a really fast connection, but as you go up in speed, you also have other limitations that come into play. When you're dealing with a USB cable, you have to think about how long that cable is. The longer the cable is, the more resistance that builds up in that cable, and the more the speed and the signal is going to deteriorate. So if you're dealing with something like a USB 4 or USB 3 Gen 2X2, you want to make sure you have a shorter cable because that's going to give you the best performance. When USB 1.0 came out, it had a limitation of only three meters, which is about nine feet. Now, when we moved into full speed, which was USB 1.1, and we moved into USB 2, we were able to use a limit of five meters, which gave us about 15 feet of distance on our cables. As we moved into USB 3 and beyond, that limitation once again dropped down to about three meters as the highest recommendation, which again is about nine feet. Now, I get a lot of people who ask me, Jason, I go on Amazon and I look at USB cables and I see some that are 20 feet or 30 feet or even 50 feet. You just told me the maximum length was three meters or five meters or three meters. Why is that? Well, this is because these are the maximum specifications that you need to understand of what is the maximum that should be supported by a device. But some manufacturers have gone beyond that to provide longer cables. Now, the problem with that is if you start using a really long cable, we are going to have signal deterioration. And this means the speeds are not going to be at that high speed that we talked about. So if you're using a USB 3 cable and that USB 3 cable has a maximum speed of five gigabits per second, but you decide to use a 25 foot cable instead of a three foot cable, that is actually going to drop your speeds and you may only see two or three gigabits per second instead of that top speed of five gigabits per second that you were expecting. So keep that in mind when you're dealing with this. Also, if you have a cable that's too long, it can actually cause that device to not work at all. And so you want to keep that in mind. And again, keep the cable as short as possible to be able to give you the maximum performance. Now, another thing we can get with these cables when we're using USB is not just data transfer back and forth as we measured in gigabits per second, but we can also provide power to our devices. Now, the amount of power that you can provide to a device over a USB cable is going to be determined based on the type of port you're using. If you're using an older USB 1.0 or 2.0 ports, those can only provide up to 500 milliamps or 0.5 amps of power. If you're using a USB 3.0 port, you can actually provide up to 900 milliamps or 0.9 amps, which gives you about four and a half watts of power. Now, those numbers are for a standard USB port, but if you're using a dedicated powered port, usually referred to as PD or powered device port, this will allow you to go higher and get up to 1500 milliamps or 1.5 amps, which translates into about 7.5 watts of power. Now, again, it's important to understand these limitations and what this effect is going to have for your end user. Let's say, for example, I take my iPad and I try to connect it to my computer to charge my iPad. Well, if I'm doing that through a USB 2.0 port, it's going to take a really long time to charge because I'm only having 500 milliamps of charge current going through that cable. But if I unplug it and plug it directly into a wall outlet that can provide me with two amps, that is now giving me four times more charge and it's going to charge my device four times faster. So while you can get power for your devices through your USB ports on your laptops and desktops, it will limit the speed they can charge at based on how strong that port is, whether it's USB 1 and 2 or USB 3 or beyond. Now, the last thing we need to cover when it comes to USB is the different types of connectors that you may come across because not all USB looks the same. If you look on a standard laptop or desktop, you're going to usually see one of two different types of USB connectors. The first one is called a type A connector, and this came from the old USB 1.0, 1.1 and 2.0 standards, but it's still supported in three and above. For a type A connector, this is a flat rectangular connector that allows you to insert the USB cable only in one direction. 
because inside of that, there's this white or black piece that's blocking about half the interior port. So when you go to plug that USB in, you have to do it in a certain direction to make the pins line up and allow you to connect that device. Type A is very commonly used on most desktops and some laptops. As I said, Type A is probably the most common one you're going to see and is the standard USB that most of us have grown up using. Now on modern machines, we have a newer version which is called Type C. Type C came about with USB 3 and beyond. When you're dealing with a Type C connector, it is going to allow you to insert that cable in either direction. When you look at that port, it looks like a small oval and because of this shape, you can actually insert the USB cable in either direction and it doesn't make a difference like it did with Type A. So when you're using type C, this is a more modern style of connector and it's a lot easier to use. When you're dealing with most modern laptops, tablets, or smartphones, they tend to use a USB type C connector as their primary type of connection. Now, speaking of these different USB devices, there's also some other connectors you may find if you're using older devices. When you're using older USB 2.0 devices, you'll come across things known as type B. And type B actually came in a type B connector, a type B mini connector, and a type B micro connector. When you're dealing with a type B connector, this is usually found on larger devices like printers. This port is more of a square shaped port with the corners rounded on the top. And so it can only be inserted in one direction. When you're dealing with a type B mini or a type B micro, these have a different shape as well. When you're dealing with a type B mini connector, this looks almost like a trapezoid where you have a longer base and a shorter top, and then it kind of goes up at an angle on the sides. These type B mini connections were often found on early tablets and smartphones, but most of these have switched to the type C connector in recent years. And the final one we have is what's known as a type B micro connector. Now a type B micro connector is shorter and skinnier than that type B mini connector and much smaller than the type B connector. When you're dealing with a type B micro, this is normally used on small devices like wearables, like smart glasses and smart watches, as well as small music players and other smaller devices like that. Once we moved into USB 3 though, type B connectors actually look a little bit differently. So here you can see a USB 2 type B connector and you can see a USB 3 type B connector. Notice the USB 3 type B connector has more of a square with a little rectangle on top of it looked more like a square with rounded off corners on the top. These are not interchangeable. And if you're using a type B device that's USB 2, it will not plug into a type B device from a USB 3 and vice versa. And again, whether you're using USB 2 or USB 3, when you're dealing with a type B connector, it's normally going to be on a larger device like a printer or something like that. Now on the other side with USB 3, you also have what's known as a type B micro connector. Now, unlike the type B micro connector with USB 2 that looked almost more like an oval or a trapezoid, the USB 3 type B micro connector almost looks like a figure eight. And so as you can see, these are not going to be compatible either going from version two to version three. And so you have to use the right cable for the right device. Most of the time, you're going to see a type B micro USB 3 connector being used on the back of portable storage devices, things like portable hard drives that you'll then plug into a USB 3 port and be able to operate at those very fast speeds of five gigabits per second or more. I know that was a ton of information and for the exam, yes, you do need to understand the cable length limitations. Yes, you need to understand how much power a USB port can provide. And yes, you do need to understand what these different USB ports and connectors look like on a cable or on a port when you look at a picture of it to be able to identify it come test day. So keep that in mind as you're studying for the exam.